Good afternoon and welcome to this ERCnet webinar. My name is Francesco Emma and I'm speaking from my office in Rome. So as usual, before starting, let me remind you that your microphones are turned off, uh, but that during and after the webinar, you can send your questions through the GoToWebinar application that appears on your screen. I will ask your question at the end of the presentation. The webinar will last approximately 30 minutes. We will then have 15 minutes available for questions. Our speaker today is Max Libeau. Uh, Dr. Libeau is probably known to several of you since he has already given an ArtNet webinar last year. Max is what we call a translational doctor. He is a pediatric nephrologist and a cell biologist with a specific interest in autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease and other seriopathies. In recent years, he has also set up a very successful international collaborative registry on polycystic kidney disease that includes biobanking. He currently holds the position of head of experimental pediatric nephrology and head of the Interdisciplinary Center for Chronically Ill Children at the University Hospital of Cologne. The title of his lecture today is Autosomal Recessive Polycystic Kidney Disease. Please, Max. Thank you, Francesco, uh, for the kind words and for the introduction, and welcome everyone uh, to this webinar, which is on ARPKD, Autosomal Recessive Polycystic Kidney Disease. Um, there we go. These are my uh, disclosures. So ARPKD, what's ARPKD? It is a genetic disorder. As uh, the name already says, it is an autosomal recessive um, disorder that is mainly caused by variants in one gene, which is called PKHD1 for polycystic kidney and hepatic disease um, 1. And um, recently, Carsten Bergman's group uh, described variants in another new gene called DZIP1L uh, as a rare cause of this already rare disease. PKHD1 encodes a large protein that is seen on this slide, um, which has a large extracellular part, a single transmembrane domain, and a short cytoplasmic tail. The function of this protein, um, fibrocystin, is very poorly understood. So clinically, um, one of the main features of ARPKD are these massively enlarged kidneys, as shown here on this MRI picture. Or as you can imagine from this picture of a patient of ours, um, this extended abdomen. And this kidney enlargement is mainly due to the dilatation, to the ubiquitous dilatation of the uh, collecting ducts in the kidney. So this is different from uh, the main brother of ARPKD, of ADPKD, where you see cysts throughout all the parts of the um, renal tubule. ARPKD mainly starts um, from the collecting duct, as seen in this nice drawing by um, in this review of Pat Wilson. So kidneys are usually large. Kidney function can be very variable. So a colleague of mine yesterday suggested that I'd show some, uh, some pictures of ARPKD kidneys. So this is what they look like, these enlarged round um, ARPKD kidneys. And if you then get closer, you can already through the capsule see all these uh, microcysts, small cysts that are, can be seen everywhere. If you take off the capsule um, of uh, the kidney, it's even clearer. And if you cut through the kidney, you can see this ubiquitous dilatation um, of the tubule. In histology, it looks like this. So in addition to um, the kidney affection, there is obligatory hepatic involvement in ARPKD. So the liver is always affected. And this is due to a defect in liver development that is called ductal plate malformation. 
And this malformation leads to hepatic fibrosis and thus portal hypertension. Um, and another liver phenotype are these dilated bile ducts as seen here on this uh, MRI. So important clinical symptoms are obviously the um, involvement of the, uh, of the kidney with um, the EGFR decline, but then in addition, severe hypertension, and many of these kids need multiple drugs, um, transient hyponatremia, then portal hypertension um, as a result of the hepatic fibrosis, and then there are infectious issues like cholangitis, uh, which is um, rather common in ARPKD, sepsis, and uh, urinary tract infections. However, overall, the clinical causes are very variable and it's very difficult to predict um, an individual clinical cause. What are the clinical criteria to diagnose um, ARPKD? Uh, these have been established already a while ago by Klaus Zeres. Um, it's the combination of the typical findings on renal imaging, and you've seen the MRI um, picture, so you can imagine um, uh, that the ultrasound also shows enlarged kidneys um, with what is called the typical salt and pepper sign in um, recent uh, in, in previous times, more recent ultrasound imaging shows um, the microcysts. And in addition to these renal imaging findings, you would need one or more of the following, which would be imaging findings consistent with the hepatic involvement or clinical or pathology findings um, of liver involvement. In addition, you're looking for the autosomal recessive uh, pattern of inheritance which is uh, the involvement of a uh, sibling and the absence of uh, renal enlargement or typical findings in parents. So the clinical um, criteria are very good. However, they were established previous uh, to the so-called genetic revolution. And more recent work has also told us that um, a number of um, genes can be affected uh, that result in ARPKD-like uh, presentations. So while the classic PKD genes um, are still the most common cause for polycystic kidney diseases, um, there are other genes that may be affected that show um, overlapping phenotypes, so-called phenocopies. And as some of these disorders like HNF1-beta uh, related disorders have substantial additional um, features of the disease, um, it is important to uh, identify these diseases early on. And that leads us um, to the first multiple choice question. You know that in these webinars, um, these um, MC questions are included. And the first question, um, is, um, is genetic testing relevant in patients with a clinical diagnosis of ARPKD? And I guess you will now um, see the different options that you can choose from. Number one would be no, um, genetic testing is not relevant as it does not have clinical consequences. Uh, number two would be, option number two would be no, genetic testing is not relevant as just one gene is important for ARPKD. Num option number three is no, genetic testing does not give reliable results in ARPKD. Option four, uh, genetic testing is mandatory uh, to clearly predict uh, the disease cause. Or option number five is genetic testing is relevant to differentiate ARPKD from phenocopies. And I guess it has now been um, started and the first votes are coming in. So we have about um, a minute that um, we have during, and during this minute you can um, answer the questions. <clears throat> So half of the time is over. Well, 
Right. Just a few more uh, seconds to go, and obviously the large majority of you um, identified the answer that I would choose. So genetic testing is relevant to differentiate ARPKD um, from uh, the pheno copies, and 85% uh, chose this one. In general, I feel that genetic confirmation of uh, the clinical diagnosis may be helpful for counseling families and when looking for subtle extrarenal manifestation in cystic um, kidney diseases, and this includes ARPKD. So let's be a bit more specific, a situation that, that many of you will know. A family comes, um, because the local um, gynecologist has seen something with the kidneys. Um, the woman is in the 25th week um, of pregnancy, and then your colleagues from Ops and Gyne come along and show you this picture, these enlarged kidneys, poor differentiation, um, and uh, the kidneys are also quite bright. This is the classical antenatal uh, finding of ARPKD, and this is what the pedigree um, of the family would look like. And again, this is compatible with a recessive mode of inheritance. So the question, uh, the, the family will then ask you, doctor, what can you tell me about uh, survival? What can you tell me about renal survival? And is there anything that we could do for the kid? Is, are there any treatment options? So let's start with survival in general. Um, there are some important and good studies out there. There is the work by the Mayo Clinic um, and work from the US from Lisa Gay Woodford um, and work from, from Europe. And what they all show, and we've summarized this recently uh, in, this, um, in this work on cystic kidney diseases and perinatal manifestation, is um, that the survival is maybe even a bit better than many of us would think um, with um, neonatal survival in these four studies um, up to even 90 uh, percent. And um, the survival afterwards, the survival of the neonatal survivors, again, uh, is quite good. So it is an important um, disease and a severe disease still, and it's still associated uh, with substantial mortality, but um, kids can uh, survive. What are causes of early death in ARPKD? This is again a picture uh, from a patient of ours. It's pulmonary hypoplasia um, after oligo or anhydramnios. It's sepsis in CKD or in patients on kidney replacement therapy. It can be KRT problems very, very early in life. Um, or it can obviously be the parent's decision uh, to withdraw um, care. Just some, some of the examples. What about renal survival? What can we tell um, the families about renal survival? Um, and there are a number of observational studies going on that try to characterize the clinical causes of ARPKD. Uh, there's Lisa's work in the US, there's Larissa Karachuk's work um, within uh, renal radar in the UK, and we have set up um, this AREG PKD registry that Francesco already mentioned. So what are we doing in the registry? Um, we are collecting a basic data set, um, asking for family history, the mode of presentation, etc. And then we try to follow these patients about once a year, asking for sonomorphological changes, asking for the development of kidney function, etc. Currently, uh, more than 100 centers from 30 countries um, have registered. Um, for this study uh, that is supported by multiple um, national and international uh, societies, including the GPN, the ESPN, um, and ERGNET. Um, <clears throat> where are we with the patients? We have more than 600 uh, patients included by now, actually 634, and uh, we have about 3,000 independent um, visits of these patients. And what is um, important is that 
um, we have about 200 patients with uh, five, at least five visits and about 100 patients with 10 visits so that we can now start to follow longitudinal causes of ARPKD. This is uh, the current cohort. It's mainly a pediatric uh, cohort as uh, most of the centers are um, pediatric nephrology centers and it covers uh, all age ranges uh, of childhood and adolescence. However, there are some adults um, that are included and they are particularly interesting. What about renal survival? That was the question that was asked um, in our um, cohort, which is a bit special obviously, but in this large cohort we see um, that about 50 percent, um, we see about 50 percent renal survival by the age of 20 years. There are these kids um, that are severely affected um, and that may require uh, kidney replacement therapy very, very early, even when in the first weeks of life. Um, and this is this uh, severely affected sub-cohort that you can see here in this Kaplan-Meier curve. And then there seems to be some um, continuous uh, progression of loss of kidney um, function or of kidney survival. Are there any particularly risk factors, um, particular risk factors for early dialysis dependency? This is something that we looked at uh, a few years ago. Um, we Back then we identified 36 patients that required dialysis in the first year of life um, and compared them to about 350 patients that did not require um, dialysis in the first year of life, all of these kids with ARPKD. And we looked at pre, peri and postnatal uh, information and we're not going to go through all these details. What you see is that there are a number of um, uh, differences between the subgroups as expected and when we take this to the multivariate model, um, some um, aspects, some parameters uh, remain um, uh, associated. That is oligoanhydramnios, that is prenatally enlarged um, kidneys, and for example, quite interesting, also a low APGA score um, in patients that do require dialysis in the first year of life. Based on these data set, um, we back then um, established a model uh, to predict probabilities for dialysis or kidney replacement therapy uh, within the first 12 or 36 months um, after birth. And um, what this shows you is actually that depending on these um, markers that you can see easily with ultrasound before birth, you have um, a stratified risk pattern uh, to develop um, dialysis dependency in the first year of life. So if you just have enlarged kidneys in ARPKD, uh, the probability uh, to require dialysis in the first year of life is much lower than if you have oligoanhydramnios enlarged kidneys and identifiable renal cysts. And um, this can help us to identify a high-risk group, for example, for uh, clinical trials. So the antenatal sonographic detection of kidney enlargement, renal cysts, and oligo or anhydramnios may help to estimate um, the risk of um, the risk for early dialysis dependency in ARPKD. That takes us to the second multiple choice um, question. So, um, what is the cause of kidney function in ARPKD? First option, all children will require KRT within the first weeks of life. Second option, only children with severe liver affection will require KRT. Third option, um, kidney replacement therapy is generally not needed until 20 years of age. Fourth option, um, kidney replacement therapy may be required in the first weeks of life or fifth option, the kidney phenotype is only variable in terms of kidney size. And now the um, you should see the different um, options. And again, we have a minute to vote.
Okay, and the minute is uh, almost over, and most of you have chosen um, uh, number four, kidney replacement therapy may be required in the first weeks of life, which um, is also what I consider best. Um, then a number of you, and as I read, go through the question, uh, again, I understand why um, a number have also chosen um, KRT is generally not needed until 20 years of age, which um, was, uh, I guess, linked to the 50% that I showed. <clears throat> so what can we tell um, the parents about treatment options? Is there anything um, that we can do? And what's the literature on this? Um, there may be um, or two um, manuscripts that may be important. Um, other ones uh, that I show here. Um, there's a specific um, uh, consensus expert recommendation um, for ARPKD. Um, that was published in JPEDS a while ago um, after a workshop that um, Lisa organized. Um, and then from the German Neocyst um, Consortium, um, there's this um, manuscript on perinatal diagnosis management and follow-up of cystic uh, renal diseases um, that was published a couple of years ago in, in JAMA uh, Pediatrics. So to summarize um, the key messages, um, we must say that currently it is still symptomatic treatment that we're doing. We should aim for symptomatic treatment under the best possible um, conditions for such a child. Um, and that may include that you plan delivery uh, in a center where there is a good NICU um, that is also equipped um, uh, to treat such a difficult uh, patient, uh, where there is multidisciplinary pre- and postnatal um, care and consultation uh, for these kids and their families. As for other renal disorders, um, peritoneal dialysis um, is the preferred um, method for neonates in ARPKD. Treatment of hypertension may require multiple anti-hypertensive anti uh, agents um, and um, it may be helpful to uh, tolerate uh, sodium levels a bit more on the lower side. And then a topic that is um, frequently discussed is uh, the topic of uh, nephrectomies um, and the rational for unilateral nephrectomy is based on few uh, and small nutritional studies. And um, in the, in the uh, JPET paper, we summarized that actually there is no published evidence um, that nephrectomy uh, results in respiratory improvement. There's also no published evidence uh, to support uh, nephrectomy for severe hypertension in early ARPKD. What we looked at in, in the registry uh, study now um, uh, was um, the consequences of very early bilateral nephrectomies. So what we did um, in this ARED PKD analysis is we defined four subgroups. And these were kids that underwent bilateral nephrectomies uh, within the first three months of life, and we called them FEPNEM for very early bilateral nephrectomies. Um, and we compared them to various control groups. One controlled group um, underwent bilateral nephrectomies in the year afterwards. One control group underwent um, dialysis, um, but with at least one kidney in place. Um, and one control group had total kidney volumes that were comparable uh, to the total kidney volumes of the FEPNE group. And we compared all the pre- and perinatal aspects that I've shown you um, in, the, in our uh, first paper for risk factors on um, very early dialysis and did not find um, a lot of differences um, between all these four groups. There were a few differences, but not um, many. However, what we did see is um, that severe neurological complications, and we define this as ischemia, infarction, parenchymal defects, um, hypoxic encephalopathy, or atrophy of the optical nerve with loss of vision, 
were much more frequently seen in the kids um, that underwent bilateral nephrectomies in the first three months of life. So in 12 out of 19 Febner kids, um, we found some of these severe neurological complications. But only in two out of nine um, kids with early bilateral nephrectomy, in two out of 12 kids with very early dialysis, and in none of the kids with um, uh, the, that we called total kidney volume control. And these are the, the Kaplan-Meier curves um, comparing these different uh, subgroups for survival without severe neurological complications. And you can see that the kids with very early bilateral nephrectomies um, show this rapid uh, decline of uh, survival without complications. If we turn it around and look for risk factors that are associated um, with severe neurological complications in uh, this cohort, we could identify two independent risk factors. And one was the very early bilateral nephrectomy and the other one were, um, was the documentation of severe hypotensive episodes. So very early bilateral nephrectomies in children with ARPKD may be associated with more neurological complications. And uh, this is just um, a matter that, you know, to be considered um, when taking the decision uh, for nephrectomy. One discussion is about peritoneal dialysis. I sometimes hear, okay, it does not work in, in ARPKD. Um, we compared this in a data set from the IPPN registry um, organized by, by Franz Schäfer, and we uh, identified 87 ARPKD uh, patients and matched them with um, patients um, suffering from congenital nephrotic syndrome or CACUT, uh, one to one or one to two and um, in the end could compare 79 ARPKD patients um, to CNS and CACUT patients. And to make a long story uh, very, very short, um, what we could see that in this um, specific cohort of young children, not neonates, but young children, um, actually we did not see a difference um, concerning the uh, per peritoneal dialysis technique survival uh, between the three groups. So PD can be used in young children with ARPKD as in children with other early onset renal diseases. That takes us to the multiple choice question number three. What are treatment approaches in ARPKD? Option one would be gene therapy for ARPKD is established and is curative. Option two, targeted and disease-modifying treatment is available. Treat, uh, option three, treatment remains symptomatic. Option four, P peritoneal dialysis is not possible in ARPKD as kidneys are too large. And option five, ARPKD patients must undergo bilateral nephrectomy as soon as possible. And I guess you can now vote again. Okay, this, these are the last seconds of the vote and um, more than 90% or 90% um, have chosen uh, option three, treatment remains symptomatic. Right, um, to um, comment a bit on the limitations of um, all these data at the end, obviously um, 
AOHPKD um, is an observational um, study. This is real-world clinical data um, and not a, a clinical trial. Um, some limitations include that there are partially missing genotypes, there are partially missing data points in some of these um, uh, data sets. For sure, this is a, a registry study and uh, there are various levels of, of bias. One is a selection bias um, in two ways. Um, one selection bias may be that we do not include a lot of the most severely affected children that pass away um, quickly as the centers may not dare to approach these families. Uh, another bias is that mainly tertiary centers are um, including data, so um, we may also have a bias towards um, kids that are transferred to tertiary centers and may be a bit more severely um, affected. Just some of the limitations or caveats uh, to keep in mind when looking at this at this data. To summarize, ARPKD in newborns remains a clinical challenge or ARPKD in general. Um, genetics may be helpful to establish the correct diagnosis. Treatment for ARPKD currently remains largely symptomatic and opinion-based. Uh, first observational evidence is emerging. Um, I've shown you data on um, the bilateral nephrectomies um, or the data on the um, peritoneal dialysis in young children. Um, and then I do very much feel that we need translational international research approaches um, to progress in this very rare uh, disease um, as a basis for, you know, evidence-based and targeted uh, therapies um, in pediatric PKD. And with that, I uh, come to the end. I want to thank uh, especially Katrin, who does a great job in, um, uh, you know, running the registry. Um, and being in touch with all the, the centers. I want to uh, thank the funding agencies. I want to um, particularly thank um, all the sites that um, uh, continue to um, enter uh, data into the registry, the collaborators. And I want to quickly um, point to the upcoming webinars uh, in the next week, Roxana um, and then Simone. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max, for this very interesting uh, webinar and also for showing us some very uh, interesting data that that really could only be collected with the registry that you set up. So uh, please send in your question. I see that some are coming already. Um, the first question is actually one that I also had. It comes from Christy um, Thomas. Um, and the question is whether you could clearly establish a relationship between the nephrectomy and the hypotensive episodes. Yeah, so that's that's what we all feel. Um, if you look at it from the statistical point of view, they come out as um, independent uh, uh, factors. So mm -hmm. um, we we must say that. Um, that's why I also said it's the documentation of severe hypotensive episodes. We must say that um, at this point, um, we can only rely on the data that we have from the centers. And um, that is just what's being documented in the registry. Uh, we do not have the full access to all the blood pressure um, values uh, all over the time. Okay, and, and just quickly as a side question, if you have an answer, um, because uh, indeed some of these patients, when you nephrectomize them, they become really hypotensive. Um, do you have any uh, specific uh, treatment uh, when these patients run with a very low blood pressure? What do you do? Yeah, I guess we do. We do what everyone else is trying to do, um, but there is no specific treatment that I be aware of that um, that would help. What we um, do um, is we we you know um, look at um, at sodium levels. We um, have added sodium uh, into um, the P 
SPD fluid in some of these patients. Um, uh, we, we watch their uh, fluid status very, very carefully. Um, and, you know, we are fully aware that um, there are sometimes situations where you just have no other choice than uh, to do the nephrectomy and maybe then in a second step the, the second nephrectomy. And, it, you know, we've seen it also in even knowing this data, we've seen it over here too. Um, we've also had um, good and bad outcomes, um, but we just try to um, yeah, monitor these, these kids very, very closely for their fluid status. So we basically do, we all do the same thing. And uh, Guillaume Pintos Morel was actually asking you something that you may already have uh, mentioned in your talk, but could it be that patients who underwent very early by bilateral nephrectomy um, actually had more severe ARPKD? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's a question um, that that comes along a few, a few um, every now and then. I mean, we try to um, to answer it by having these three control groups and by uh, looking at um, uh, all these pre, peri, and postnatal um, uh, data sets. Obviously, there is not the one way to fully rule out that there may be an additional um, independent neurological aspect um, of ARPKD um, that we are not yet aware of. Okay, then we have a question for Dr. Loukia Sifaki from uh, Greece. Uh, she uh, and starts to thank you for the webinar and, um, um, and, uh, and is asking whether um, you, would, you could comment on renal disease in children. And I'm reading her question or this question, I apologize. Um, um, whether there is, you comment on the risk of renal disease in children and adults with heterozygous uh, mutation for ARPKD who present with high renal echogenicity at the ultrasound with normal renal function. What is the yeah. prognosis in these adults? Is there any specific recommendation for follow-up apart from evaluating kidney function once a year? Right. Um, to my knowledge, there's mainly one study uh, from the US that uh, looked at obligate um, heterozygous uh, carriers of um, PKHD1 uh, variants. Um, and what they found is exactly what um, the colleague describes is um, they found some mild um, changes on ultrasound without affection of kidney function. And so that, that's the data we have. There are no specific recommendations, to my knowledge. Could there be some modifier genes in these patients? Yes, there could be modifier genes. There um, is also um, data out there from, from Carsten Bergman and others um, that have shown um, that a co-occurrence of um, variants in different uh, PKD genes um, can lead to severe phenotypes. Um, for example, the co-occurrence of a PKD2 um, variant with a PKHD1 um, variants um, or of HNF1 beta and PKHD1, etc. Um, this, this has been shown and um, both in patients and also in multiple mouse models. Okay. <clears throat> Question from Dr. Matthew. Uh, what modification do you use in PD in neonates? Is a mentectomy a must? Yeah, we, we usually um, perform it just, um, and um, what we've seen in the IPPN data is, um, you know, which is not a very big surprise, is that we have um, had lower uh, filling volumes in ARPKD patients compared to the other. Um, to the other groups, and that they use more cycles. All right. So again, Dr. Christy Thomas is asking um, whether in those children with refractory uh, hyponatremia and fluid restriction, um, what should we do next? 
with refractory hyponatremia and fluid restriction. Um, yeah, well, you've, you've done the first uh, steps, so what we would do is then add um, sodium. What um, I tried to, I, um, to say is that we would um, also accept um, somewhat lower sodium values in these kids. Um, so in the range of, you know, low 130 uh, or even to, to 130. Um, we've sometimes seen that um, this may directly uh, affect um, uh, blood pressure. All right, Dr. Mehmet uh, Tastemir is asking, is hyponatremia a frequent problem after renal transplantation in children with ARPKD? No, not to my not to my knowledge. No, and I I don't see a reason why why that would be um, why that should be the case. No. Yeah, I would agree with you. And 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 you you would you comment on the nephrectomy in patients that undergo transplantation for APKD? Yes. Um, so again, it is an individual decision. Um, so uh, the, the colleague um, that uh, suggested that I um, showed the picture just yesterday actually um, was doing a transplant um, in an ARPKD kid. In this kid, we decided to take out um, one of the kidneys um, at the time point of the transplantation. Um, and uh, I guess from, from our experience from the ARAT PKD data set, this is what many, many uh, centers are doing uh, to take out one kidney at the time point. Um, of transplant. All right. So uh, we sometimes see when you when you have to take out one kidney very early in life, so independent from from the transplant, um, is that if you take out one, then uh, the other kidney uh, sometimes starts to um, grow very very rapidly, uh, so that you end up in a situation where you have to take out the second one too. Mm -hmm. So that's something to consider when you decide to um, to go for unilateral nephrectomy. All right, so uh, Jalila is asking you, uh, what would you advise in counseling a family for TOP if they uh, had already um, if they had already a sibling with very severe neonatal death. Right. Um, so it is very, it's a very difficult decision. Um, so we know that there may be intrafamilial uh, variability in ARPKD and that is very, very poorly understood. Um, it is generally believed that about 20% um, of these uh, siblings show some degree of variability. Um, you know, TOP obviously is a matter um, that has multiple uh, layers, ethical layers, religious aspects, uh, you know, um, and obviously the, the law aspect. Um, I tend to, uh, or my, my, my feeling is that we, you know, should be very open um, with these families and just, you know, tell them what we know and what we don't know. And right now, there, apart from the data that I've shown, there's hardly any way to really predict um, the causes. And um, so the, the family needs to, um, take this decision as well informed as possible. But uh, let me just follow up on this question. But besides uh, what you just mentioned, would you comment on what we know about phenotype genotype correlation? Is there still some correspondence between severe mutations and milder mutations? Right. So, what is known is that. Um, uh, or let me start the other way around. It was for a long time thought that biallelic um, truncating mutations would not be compatible with life. Um, now, recently, um, there have been some um, first reports emerging um, on patients that did survive and um, had uh, substantial or severe ARPKD, but 
but did survive also survived well um and um so so that's an important novel aspect apart from that um in arpkd we're facing the situation that most of the patients have private variants or private mutations um so there is one uh, mutation that is a bit more common um that accounts for 15 percent or so but there's not like the one hot spot um as in other other diseases so in general um we can at this point just say that biallelic truncating mutations are associated with a more severe phenotype but um, also missense mutations can go along uh, with severe phenotypes and All obviously right. with RHPKD we're trying to um, to identify uh, a, 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 yeah, a deeper correlation. Okay. So, uh, uh, Quentin Bertrand is asking you, uh, when evolution needs peritoneal dialysis, is nephrectomy usually done? Um, is it most frequently a unilateral nephrectomy to keep diuresis? I think you partially already answered this question, but I don't yeah, know if yeah, you to yeah. add some comments. So, um, yeah, my, my, my feeling is if there's a way, if the kids are very young, if there's a way to keep the kidney in, um, we would try to keep it in. Um, I know that, um, especially in the first three months of life, um, and um, sometimes it's just impossible and um, uh, PD will not work, then you have to take it out or have to take one out. Yeah. Um, we have a question again from Mehmet uh, Tansimir. Is those patients who underwent, um, oh no, I know, actually, um, I, I guess this was part of the previous question. I do apologize because when I asked the question, I canceled the question that has been asked so that I don't uh, make mistakes. Um, so um, I, will, I will just go to... Uh, uh, next question, Guillaume Pintos Morel. Um, he's asking you. <laughs> um, so, when we have a PKHD2 type, are there phenotypic differences? Right. Um, so, there is this uh, DZIP1L uh, gene that Carsten identified. Um, however, this is this is really very few patients by now. Um, so. I wouldn't dare to make um, a real uh, statement on a specific phenotype um, uh, yet. Um, so we will we will have to see whether others um, whether other centers um, also identify additional um, patients with these one L variants or um, even uh, additional genes. And that I think also covers the <clears throat> last question by Dr. Matthew, who wanted you, who were asking you to comment on the new gene phenotype. Um, if I can, uh, Max, before leaving, um, uh, ending the the webinar, um, can I ask you uh, um, one last question? Is that um, um, with the data of your uh, registry, do you have any sense that? Amnio infusion, prenatal amnio infusion, um, can be helpful in severe cases. Um, I, so we are asking for it. Um, the last time I we we looked at it, we didn't have um, that much data on this specific aspect. But um, I must say it's been a while since I looked at it. So um, uh, we will need to check this again. Um, back then, we couldn't draw any, um, any real clear-cut conclusions yet. All right. And with this, uh, Max, I really would like to thank you very much for this wonderful update on ARPKD. And to you all, I would like to remind you the next webinar, especially in these times where we don't get a chance to go to meetings and to uh, hear a lot of lectures, I think this webinar are particularly precious. Uh, the next one will be on access for chronic hemodialysis by Robshana Shroff and, um, and then Simone Baldovino 
will give us uh, a lecture on systemic amyloidosis. Um, as we probably have mentioned before, ErgNet is just not pediatric nephrology. It covers all of nephrology. And um, we are very happy to also have some topics that are probably the, uh, more of interest to adult nephrologists. So thank you again to everybody. And, um, and please join us on May 7th. Thank you very much. And thank you, Max.